want to start with letting the panel introduce, uh, introduce itself. So I'll start with uh, David De La Rosa. I am uh, David De La Rosa from, anybody hear me? David De La Rosa from Telet. Uh, Telet is a pure play IoT company. Um, we develop uh, modules for the IoT world uh, from actual uh, the silicon part all the way to the IT system, including network services, cellular. We also have a, a, a strong play in the in factory space. We are installed in Fortune 500 companies. Okay, and Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Schnabley, Director of Engineering IT for Melisco Engineering. As you saw from uh, the presentation, um, we're having a process, uh, system integration uh, for pharma, life sciences, uh, food and beverage, uh, dairy brewing. Been with Melisco for uh, 19 years. So uh, seen a lot of different clients, seen a lot of different uh, kind of seen this industry transition from very proprietary over to the ITOT convergence. Okay. And actually, that uh, leads us, uh, Steve, to our, our first question is, as a systems integrator, how has ITOT convergence, control and information convergence, affected the systems integrator uh, function? So it, it's, it's grown. Uh, you know, a lot of our folks are more uh, control, so they're, they're not quite as IT-centric. So it's kind of opened up a new kind of a, a new challenge for us to teach our guys, okay, you need to make sure that you're, you're looking at both sides and we, we engage both IT and, and, and OT together to kind of become the moderator, to kind of bring them together. Uh, you know, a lot of times the, the, the controls people at the plant may not be talking or, or as much as they should with their IT counterparts. So we kind of fit that, nit, that niche in there to kind of bring them together. So it's, it's been a, a challenge, but it's been ongoing and working out pretty good. Okay, now, now Welton, um, are you, do you leverage uh, systems integrators as well, or is that based on your, your, your factory's policy or Johnson & Johnson policy, or how are you, uh, do you leverage systems integrators for your upgrades? Uh, it's a mix of both. Uh, uh, initially, when we bring in uh, hardware equipment, manufacturing platforms, what have you, it's usually a system integrator or an OEM that's involved uh, as far as uh, uh, the building and developing of the system. But from that point forward, depending on the scope and the size and the complexity of the project, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, personnel in-house that can perform some of those functions as well. Okay, and how about at uh, Bosch and Long? Yes, Same it really it really depends on the business. Um, Certainly in our farm and our uh, lens care businesses, we almost exclusively work with OEMs and, and system integrators. Yeah. And David, how often would you say systems integrators are involved uh, with deploying your telet solutions? Um, actually, we have a, a, a good set of system integrators that, that use our device-wise tool. But in general, our device-wise tool um, allows for the, the it bridges the IT and the OT space uh, very quickly without a, a tremendous amount of effort or even cost of programming. So it actually brings the two worlds together uh, a lot easier than in the past. Okay. Uh, and I'll have a, I have a question across the board for, we'll, we'll, we'll go from one end of the panel to the other, we're probably starting with Brad. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge that you have in the plant with uh, IT and OT convergence? Uh, I, I guess I think it's, it's probably, um, getting everybody up to speed on, on what it is and on why we need to have this ITOT convergence. Uh, so it's selling them on the benefits of uh, uh, improved data access or, or data collection. Uh, and, and it's also get, getting the groups together. We're uh, now at Bausch Alam being owned by Valiant. We have a partner in Chicago that, that helps us with a lot of our IT support and our networking support. So they're not a, a part of our company. And then we have folks at, at uh, Valiant, we have folks at Bosch and Lam. So really from an IT standpoint, we're very fractured. Mm -hmm. So we need to try to bring all those groups together, plus the site groups to get any you know, significant project done. So it's a real challenge today. Okay, uh, systems integrated, Steve? Yeah, like I said before, the big challenge yeah. is, is trying to get uh, the two sides working together. And, and be we're kind of the in-between guys, so we gotta, we got to play nice with both sides of the of, of the fence, and really, you know, like I said, getting them involved early on and not just uh, an afterthought is a big key that we push our guys and you know make sure both sides are talking early on and often to make sure that that things go off without a hitch. Okay, and Welton, I would say I'd like to echo that uh, those same sentiments. 
uh, biggest difficulty is uh, making sure that uh, up front that the IT and the engineering guys are, are talking together, as I kind of alluded to in, our, in my story. Uh, uh, that can cause some, some big issues uh, that you weren't expecting. Uh, I would say probably next to that would be uh, uh, the skill sets that are necessary for, uh, it, for both sides to play. That's changed quite a bit over the last 20 years, so you need to know a little bit of both sides of the house that's controls engineering uh, and a little bit of the IT. And I would say the biggest thing, and uh, probably from an enterprise uh, level for us, uh, challenges is security. Uh, that's a big deal, uh, particularly, particularly with some of the breaches that ha happened last year, uh, where you're talking like Target and Home Depot and those kind of things. Even though uh, in, uh, in, we're not like a financial company or anything like that, there's still uh, a lot of uh, data that you want to that, that that's floating around and mm -hmm. you uh definitely want to make sure that you're handling that very securely yeah and uh, and david as far as the challenges you see from Telus perspective well what we see in our, in our customers uh the the it and the ot uh they there's a little level of distrust because um you know the it the ot space the control space is very unique unlike the it so what we do and vice versa and what we do with our tool we created this role-based um, schema that uh, the controls person has full domain of what they know, but has enough visibility to the IT that it will not harm the IT and the reverse. The IT, the IT team has maybe access to two process points and maybe read only, but they don't have access to everything else. So they both are in kind of harmony. Next question for the, for the panel that we'll uh, work our way down regard, is regarding the Purdue model. Is, you know, this sometimes when we're talking to customers, some people say the Purdue model is, you know, is gonna, is gonna live in infamy for, for a long, long time. Uh, other people are saying that, uh, that obviously more of an IOT and, and getting away from the Purdue model is a way of, uh, is a way of going. Um, what's your opinion as far as the, the life of the Purdue model, both in your facilities and in the solutions you deploy? So I'll start with Brad. I think the Purdue model is a good one. I think it's just a matter of, uh, it's kind of the, the, the degree of the angle and the triangle. I mean, I think that it, the triangle is starting to shrink, in, or sh shrink down. Uh, ERP wants to get closer to the process. The process wants to get closer to ERP systems. So uh, to do that, you know, we're, deploying, you know, as, as easy to use software tools such as Telets, you know, to, to try to build those bridges. But uh, I, I think it's still valid to have, you know, because just from a security standpoint, to have these levels in the sand where you define boundary points between what is enterprise, because enterprise kind of connects out to, to the world. And we don't really want our manufacturing systems connected to the world. We're not really ready yet in a regulated industry to, to have everything be in the cloud or have everything be accessible. Steve? So as a system, systems integrator, we typically will operate from the, the low level up to getting data to the, to the enterprise. We don't really transition over that, that boundary, but what we wanna see is, is more and more the ability to make that connection easy and not have anything custom. Uh, the more configurable software that you can have, obviously the, the easier it is to, 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 to configure, to, to ins install. Uh, but for our guys that really aren't IT-centric necessarily, to get that data, to be able to expose stuff and be able to, to, to work with uh, IT to be able to, to transition that boundary is pretty important. Okay, I'll go with uh, Wilton as far as the Purdue model in uh, Johnson & Johnson and your plant. Uh, we have an, uh, uh, a mix of both. Uh, uh, there, I think each the Purdue model has its uh, you know place where it's probably more uh, appropriate, depending on what kind of plant you're in. But the getting data from uh, the lowest level of where it's the uh, where it's generated is definitely going to be a more of a is becoming more is more. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of that these days because. Uh, you've got groups uh, that you might think that are in IT are, but not really IT folks. They're data analytics people that are 
looking at sensor data and um, pressure information that's coming, that's being pushed up to th through uh, products like DeviceWise into data lakes and doing sophisticated analysis on it to make the products better uh, or whatever manufacturing process is better. So uh, you definitely, I think you're gonna continue to see both, but you're gonna see a whole lot more uses of IoT in some of the strangest of places. Would you agree, David, or? Yes, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, everybody in the panel. The, the Purdue model is a good guide and it's a good uh, discipline on how to do systems, but you want to have the flexibility to send data out of band without disturbing the existing validated systems. For example, if you have a sensor that is about to basically go bad, it could, the, the, the system can generate a trouble ticket automatically to like an SAP PM or some, uh, create a Jira issue without affecting the, the Purdue model. So I see more of that happening and you know, our tool device-wise allows for that level of integration. You do the data acquisition, but in addition, you could reach the MES layer and the ERP layer uh, easily. But I see that trend happening. You know, one, one common thread in, in all your answers um, of all the last few questions is certainly we're always talking about connectivity, we're talking about cybersecurity, what is accessible to the outside world, what will never be accessible. What's kind of like the, the you know, obviously there's a trade-off between when you, you know, the, connect, the, the benefits of being connected and the security of either not being connected or having the right firewall. Uh, what's kind of the criteria that you use in your respective facilities or that you find your respective customers um, you know, giving, telling you. So, so Brad, as far as what's kind of the criteria between the benefit of connectivity versus when it's maybe the, the risk is too great to, to connect or they don't feel, or do they feel comfortable yet with the technology available with cybersecurity or is there still that doubt that maybe we should leave it not connected? I think probably the prevailing thought is, is to is to wait until we feel more comfortable. Uh, I, I think uh, obviously people, you know, ask for and try to make more more connections. And but I think we're really trying to be cautious. We're, we're an industry that tends to be very cautious because of the amount of regulations that we have to comply with. So I, I think that there's a lot of benefits, but uh, along with those benefits, like you said, come a lot of risks. And so I. I think it really, with everything we do, and we, we're trying to move toward this uh, in a large sense in our industry, is everything should be risk-based. Because in the past, we've done everything, we've kind of overdone the regulations. And so as we try to, to make sense out of everything, whether it be IAT, OT, or even how we validate systems, we're trying to do that all based on risk. So I think uh, uh, for us right now, it's still too risky, and we want to you know, wait for others to to blaze that trail for us. Yeah, what is uh, Melisco saying? So uh, we have clients kind of on both ends. We have a lot of clients that are in regulated industries, just like Bausch, that you know they'll put a system in back in early 2000s that are running on legacy OS, uh, not really up to date on antivirus, but they're completely islands. Uh, so it's tough to get those types of clients to move into the connected enterprise because of those constraints. And obviously it's a tough, tough for them to write a, a use case to to spend the money to upgrade because it's purely an upgrade just so you're more secure. But then we have other clients that, that truly embrace it and and you know they'll, they'll, they'll put as much data as they can and allow access and, and expose data to the enterprise. So it's kind of, it's really interesting to see the, the mix between the two different types of clients. Okay, well. And we're a lot like that as well. Um, the, there are systems that, that are older and legacy systems that have a hard time uh, connecting and maybe can't get on our corporate networks due to compliance reasons, but uh, there's uh, definitely uh, uh, an effort afoot that uh, is trying to connect everything because there's value in uh, being able to look down and see what assets that you have and uh, also uh, checking that they are compliant uh, whether that be uh, with hardware or software. And uh, as far as our models on how we try to achieve that is we try to isolate those things that should be isolated and uh, open up just the portals to get to the, to the devices or to the uh, assets that we need to get through and put ACLs around things uh, uh, to try to reduce our risk. Uh, but we 
definitely are trying to make is anything that's automated or anything that's a computer visible to the enterprise because you can have a, a lot uh, reduce your cost of personnel uh, mm -hmm. by having all of this stuff monitored or ha being able to be accessed and keeps you uh, compliant and keeps you from having uh, other uh, problems. Yes, I was going to say it's probably also the trade-off between being able to do remote maintenance. Yes. You know, especially exactly. as the, the number of personnel in the plants has certainly contracted uh, over the years and just being able to monitor and maintain those machines from kind of any, any point on the planet. I know, uh, David, uh, you know, you've been in the, uh, I guess in the beginning, you started in the M2M uh, business uh, before IoT was quite the buzzword it is. So uh, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I agree with the panel. We have some, some customers that don't allow any access in, but uh, to ones that, uh, of course, uh, it's a lot more open. The trend is to allow third parties or partners to come in remotely. Uh, what we do in, in our product to alleviate their concerns, again, is we have this role-based security model. So we, uh, like an integrator, will belong to a group that is only allowed to do three things. And then when they connect, and the connection is controlled by the customer, it's outbound only, and when they need it. So the integrator comes in, and, uh, and, and basically we put them on a sandbox, and then when it's done, the connection is gone. But the trend is definitely a lot uh, remote collaboration because you know the machines are getting more complex, uh, the headcount, the IP is, is higher, and, and you know you have to be able to scale, and you need to leverage this remote uh, kind of access. Okay, uh, Mark, we have some audience questions. So actually, you asked a very good question. I, I wanted to specifically ask um, how do you, how often do your vendors? whether they are the primary component or a secondary component in your system, how often do they announce upgrades? How close to zero downtime is the process of upgrading? And who is carrying out these upgrades for you? Brad or Will? Um, I guess the first question, so we, so, so we do upgrades uh, usually only when we're forced you know, too, by the system. So, so we don't tend to just uh, apply every patch that comes out from Microsoft or from the automation vendors. We also tend to, um, I guess the other part of your question was in terms of like allowing access. We, we try to allow access to, to our integrators uh, for the individual systems, but we, we, we don't allow them to really make changes that are uncontrolled. So we really, don't try to make changes to the system because they're validated systems. You know, any change we make, we have to go through change management process and, and revalidation process. So it's a, it, it uh, is a burden on us that uh, has to provide value at the end, so. Okay, and Weldon? Uh, pretty much the same thing. Uh, uh, being in a validated environment, uh, everything is under change control. But as far as what uh, drives uh, an, an upgrade or, uh, or a patch, if there's some vulnerability that uh, that's known or that a vendor says, hey, if, if we need to apply this patch and we think it, we're going to put us at risk, we will uh, usually do that in a test environment, uh, verify that it doesn't break anything uh, that, uh, uh, that in production or that if we de uh, deployed it to production and go ahead and, uh, and uh, put it out there because uh, if it's a vulnerability for them and we're using their products, then it's a vulnerability to us. And uh, if we're as many of these uh, deployments as that we're going to have, I mean, it's you know it puts business at risk. Uh, as far as upgrades, we typically don't upgrade uh, unless there's absolutely uh, uh, necessary because if it's if it's not broke, don't fix it. So and. If it's secure, then we're, we're all happy. Steve, what about from the systems integrator? Uh, typically, what, you know, kind of mirror what, what both these guys said is when we're asked to do upgrades or apply patches, you know, with the virtual world, we, we will get the image of the, of the running system deployed in a sandbox environment, apply those patches or apply those upgrades basically run a an offline validation, if you will, and make sure that things run just like they used to. Uh, and, and in opportunities that we have, we will take those virtual images that were then tested and deploy them so we can deploy pretty quickly. Um, 
but most places are the same mindset as if it's not broke, don't fix it and, and kind of leave it alone. But we do have some clients that will patch like Microsoft patches on a, on a routine basis or even a, an application patch on a routine basis. But it really, really depends. And most people will, will just kind of leave the system as is until there's a major enhancement. And then David, what about your Telex customers? Uh, they vary, uh, but they all align. Uh, basically, if it's uh, not broken, uh, it's not broken, don't fix it. Uh, but uh, many use uh, virtualization techniques, uh, like what we provide. They test it offline sometimes and they, they deploy at the appropriate time. So it depends on the industry. On a highly regulated industry, it's not uh, very simple. In discrete manufacturing, they usually wait for maybe a weekend or one of the two planned shutdown times, uh, but they don't make changes. You know, They're making parts, and they don't want to apply things unless it's a vulnerability or something of the kind. Yeah, I was going to say the holy grail is thou shall never have unscheduled downtime. <laughs> Well, another thing to add there, you know, one of the things we do is we always look for partners, whether it be on the software side or integration side, who really understand uh, change management and patch management because uh, like with uh, our automation vendors, per se, we'll go in and ask them up front, how do you evaluate Microsoft patches? Show us your, your uh, team or, or explain to us your process for evaluating these changes as they come because we do have changes that we we really need to apply especially now as these systems become more open the the security vulnerability so when Microsoft provides a patch that we believe is important for cybersecurity we're going to want to apply that and so we need them to be vetting those things for on the applications that we're running on those servers that have Microsoft OS's and we also tend to try to stay away from the commercial OSs in a lot of our equipment. We, we tend to like systems that, that aren't commercially available or a little more closed so that we don't have to worry about adding virus protection, you know, managing the patches along the way. It's just a safer, a more less risky environment for us. Okay. Mark, do you have any other questions? Yeah, so we heard from Andy in his keynote about a connected worker and how there's this new growth of user interface, path of mobility, et cetera, and new technology. And I was just wondering, it, kind of you describe a challenge of you don't make a change because it's not broken, but other people and new entrants into the market do make sets of changes and create competitive advantage through introduction of new technology, which drives new efficiencies. So how do you, from a production and an OT perspective, look and evaluate technologies that are going to enhance the way the worker does the work, not necessarily how the system does the work. Hmm. Weldon or Red? You want to go first? So uh, what, it sounds like, your, how do we, sounds like your question is, uh, how do we evaluate whether if we change this or do this upgrade, uh, is it going to benefit? Are the benefits going to be greater than the uh, uh, the, the cost of not doing it? Is 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 that a better way? Is no. So we're we're talking about is automation technology, which is process driven and process based. But uh -huh. the other side of the automation is the human, right? right? And so what we're seeing in IT is the consumerization of IT. People bringing their own devices. Yeah. Obviously, you don't want to do that. But we're also seeing in the industrial space, people bringing in their own industrial devices from a company perspective, where they're saying, hey, we want to improve the capability of the human. We want to go ahead and bring a mobile device in, which was sort of described there. Mm -hmm. and I was just curious, how do you guys go about evaluating which of those technologies will be secure enough, will be able to fit into the, the OT side of the house versus it just being something that IT actually brings to as a solution? Does that, does that clarify? Yeah, it uh, clarifies. For the most part, uh, as far as everything's going to be driven by cost. What is it going to cost me to implement this, and how many more units am I going to get out the, the back of the machine uh, you know, if I implement it? If, if, that, if, that cost out, if the benefits outweigh the cost, then uh, usually it's uh, a business person who uh, says, hey, IT guys, engineering guys, you know, they may or may not be aware that there may be some security issue or some some problem, but they uh, depend on us to figure it out and and and, and make it work. Uh, and we haven't been unsuccessful thus far uh, as far as uh, being able to do that. 
Brad, you have? I, I guess it depends on what the tool is. I mean, if the, if the, if the tool is just a monitoring tool or if the tool is a maintenance aid or something like that, that, that really doesn't have a direct uh, quality impact on the process or the, or the packaging process, then we're, we have a lot more flexibility there. But if it's a tool that's going to impact uh, the process, then those things get vetted very heavily. Uh, and, and we really uh, are, in terms of bringing your own devices, we, are, we don't really have a bring your own device policy. Our, the bring your own device policy is a mobile device or things like that would have to be the uh, corporate approved device with the corporate approved software. You know, so, so we lock things down and, and uh, provide uh, security that way by controlling what devices are used. Steve from yeah for like an example if uh, you know we, we go to a client we want to implement uh, tablets on the on the market you know that's one of the big things that we try to try to push the biggest challenge we have is is the cost you know uh, trying to to sell the, or help help our, our you know plant engineer sell the idea of of the benefit of going mobile you know they have to make sure they have the wireless infrastructure in place that's probably the biggest challenge in our in our uh, in our field is going to a lot of facilities that don't have a wireless infrastructure in place on the plant floor so then you know it's, it's a bigger thing but you know we, we try to look at what's what's coming out what what is new and offer that to our clients but it is a lot of times challenging based on you know what what kind of policies uh, the end user has in place and and trying to sell that idea because you know obviously everybody's looking for a return on it okay. and David yeah, I'm uh, along those lines. Uh, our customers, um, you know, I have seen uh, the whole range, but in the end, if the ROI and the va and this business value and uh, it complies with the standards, I think by all means uh, they've done it. I have seen cases where they don't, they don't do because maybe it's just a gadget or something. Mm -hmm. But if it has business value, absolutely, I think uh, they'll go for it. Okay. And our uh, last question of the session is going to be is about about culture as far as the. You know, t traditionally, the OT culture versus the IT culture in, in some plants, obviously, that could be 180 degrees diametrically opposed. We seem to find that every plant has, uh, has, has made different progress as far as being able to unify the, the, the culture and the plants between the two domains, and sometimes that firewall still exists in between, or sometimes that firewall's been, been broken. So I'd say uh, let's, let's ask Brad and Welton, what are your experiences? Uh, as far as the, the firewalls within your own plant, and then ask Steve and David to uh, comment as well. I think uh, you know at the plants that I support within Bausch, both uh, Tampa and uh, Greenville, uh, South Carolina, the culture is very good. I mean, the, they're very different plants. They have two very different cultures, but they're also uh, the IT and OT guys, because they're small teams, they work well together. They're really, we don't really have any issues where we have, you know, a large automation team fighting against a large IT team, which is really an advantage because they, they know they have to partner. They're small groups, uh, and and they've also been very easy to work with from the outside. So as a person coming from a regional engineering team, you know, my goal is to really try to help them, uh, and not, you know tell them what to do, but, but help guide them, help make sure that they understand what other possibilities are out there, help them share between the sites and, and learn together. But it's been, I've been pleased that uh, the folks, you know, I think it's really due to the size of the team, that they've really been good at working together. Good, and well. So it's been evolution. Uh, there's a, <laughs> uh, our, in our uh, facilities, we have pretty large engineering teams and, uh, and uh, at one time pretty large I team, but that's changed a little bit. Uh, uh, and there was, I've seen it evolve from being a total love-hate relationship <laughs> to uh, a uh, situation where we recognize that, you know, n neither group's gonna be successful unless we work together. So. I would say over the last several years, it's definitely gotten better. And then there's been like a, uh, the skill sets, there's a lot of overlap nowadays where before there's, there, there, there hasn't been. So I think both groups kind of understand each other a little bit better now than maybe they did in, in years past. So it's been, it's, it's been good the last few years. Yeah, what are you finding with your customers? So, you know, we, we like I said, we position ourselves to kind of be a moderator between right. the two groups and, and really ask the questions 
bring the two groups together and, and be proactive, you know, don't wait until you run into the issue, like Weldon said with, with his project. Try to, to identify those as much as you can. Obviously, you can't identify everything, but really, really try to bring those groups together. Uh, we do have a lot of plants where they already kind of passed that stage, but there's still a lot that it's, it's you know, like the evil empire, IT versus OT, and it's still, you know, still hard to get those, those groups together, but we just have to be proactive and kind of, you know, bring them together. Okay, and your customers? Uh, well, I have seen everything. They, <laughs> even in the same industry, I have mm -hmm. seen some car makers where IT and OT, they just flat out refuse to be even friendly to the ones that management has just dissolved them and make them work together as a unit. As a software provider, uh, I have to become like an eHarmony and I have to provide a <laughs> software that, that uh, makes both sides, uh, both sides happy. So the IT guys are on their world with their pappies and their schemas and queues and the controls people are happy with their tags, their PLCs and their ladder logic and you know, algorithms and things. Mm -hmm. So, but I've seen everything. <laughs> Yeah, eHarmony, that's a good analogy. Hopefully they all like walks on the beach and they like the <laughs> same kind of wine. But with that, please, uh, please uh, join me in applauding the panel and the speakers. I think they did a great job today.